In this lecture, we'll talk about an interesting use case of GANs, which is generating images across domains. Before we get there, let's answer the questions that we left behind. One of the questions was, mini batch standard deviation is used in progressive GAN. Why is this useful? Hope you had a chance to try to find this. The answer is, in mini batch standard deviation, the standard deviation at each spatial location in a feature map across a mini batch is concatenated in a later layer of a discriminator. And the standard deviation gives an idea of the diversity of the images generated in a given mini batch. If this diversity is significantly different from the diversity in the real images from a true data set, that would incur a penalty and the generator would learn to generate diverse images. And that's the main idea of including this in progressive GAN. The second question was, why is orthogonal regularization of weights used in big GAN? The answer comes from linear algebra. Multiplication of a matrix by an orthogonal matrix leaves the norm of the or original matrix unchanged. Why is this useful? You have to recall weight initialization and batch normalization. It's useful and important to maintain the same norm across all layers. And orthogonal regularization is a method that tries to achieve this during training. With that, let's move on to the use of GANs for generation across domains, a task known as domain translation. The goal here is given an image from a source domain, we'd like to generate an image in a target domain. We'd like to learn this function g that takes us from source to target. You could look at this as a variant of GANs where the input is not a noise vector, but a source domain image. There's more to it than just changing the input. Examples of use cases could be to take a male image to change it to female, to go from sketches to photos, to take a scene and transform a summer scene to winter, and so on and so forth. Here are some examples of how domain translation can be used. Here is an example of going from semantic segmentation labels to a street scene. Similarly, labels to a facade, black and white to color, day to night, which could be very useful for autonomous navigation or self-driving data sets. Going from an aerial view to a Google map kind of an output or going from a sketch to a photo. All of these are examples of domain translation. So there are a few settings under which different methods have been proposed, which we'll focus on in this lecture. In the first setting, which is known as pair training or the supervised setting, you are given images from both domains in a paired manner. And your goal is to train a GAN that can then translate for a new image from one domain. So for every sketch, you're also given its corresponding photo in your data set. This is the first and simplest setting. In the second setting, we talk about unpaired training or unsupervised, where you have a set of sketches, you have a set of photos, they're not necessarily paired. So you do not know if for a given sketch, the corresponding photo is there in the data set or not but you still have to try to learn to go from a sketch to a photo. We call this unpaired image to image translation. 
And finally, we'll talk later about multimodal generation where you can go seamlessly between domains where the popular methods are unit and munit. Let's see each one in detail. The first method is for paired translation, which the popular method here is pix to pix. Pix to pix defined image to image translation tasks as predicting pixels from pixels. And that's why the name pix to pix and it provides a framework to perform all such tasks. pix to pix builds upon the standard GAN objective. Recall that the standard GAN objective is to maximize the likelihood of the discriminator for a discriminator and minimize the fooling rate of the generator, whereas the generator tries to maximize the second term. However, when adapting this for image to image translation tasks, the objective changes slightly. Pix to pix defines this as a conditional GAN objective, where instead of just an image X coming from the real domain, you have an image X and a corresponding image Y from another domain. In a standard GAN, given an image, and given the generated image, one would have to see which of them is fake and which of them is real. Whereas in pix to pix given an image and given another image, which may not be exactly similar to g of x, the discriminator has to tell whether this is a correct translation or not a correct translation. So the conditional GAN objective now is given by the discriminator has to maximize the probability of X and Y, assuming they are the correct paired images from sketches and photos to be real. So that's something the discriminator has to do. And the second term is where given X a sketch, for example, and Z a latent vector, G of X comma Z generates a photo. So you could consider G to be given an input from one domain, in this case sketch, it generates an image from the other domain. And the job of the discriminator is to take the original sketch and the generated photo and see if these both can be classified to be fake. And obviously the generator would want this log of one minus that quantity to be high. That's the min-max game that the generator and discriminator would play here. It's in addition to the vanilla objective, you now have the XY tuples to manage inside, inside the GAN objective. In addition to doing this, pix to pix also introduces an L1 objective to ensure that the generated image matches the original expected photo from the second domain. How is this done? The generator also tries to minimize the L1 loss, which is the sum of absolute values of each element between Y, which is the image from domain two, in our case could be a photo, and G of X, Z, X again is a sketch, an input from domain one, and Z is the latent noise vector given as input to the generator. G of XZ is the generated image from domain two. We'd like that to match Y as closely as possible, which is captured by this term in the loss function. The overall objective now becomes the standard min-max GAN objective, which is captured in the first term, which is now represented as C GAN or conditional GAN, plus some coefficient lambda times the L1 loss that forces the generated images to be close to ground truth. With this objective, pix to pix obtains fairly impressive results. An example, a couple of examples are shown below, where the input is a semantic segmentation mask, which is one domain 
and the aim is to generate the scene image which is the other domain one can see that using only the l1 loss the generation is very blurry using conditional gan the generation improves and when the two are put together the generation has a fair good amount of detail and is close to the ground truth image for this example you see a similar observation even with the second image where one goes from the semantic segmentation mask to the actual facade picture the generator architecture in pix to pix resembles a unit based architecture where there is an encoder that reduces the dimensions of the layers to go all the way till a set of till a set of bottleneck features which are then upsampled to get the final dimension of the input image or the desired image as the output similar to unit again there are skip connections that go from each layer in the encoder to its corresponding mirror layer in the decoder very similar to what we saw in unit for semantic segmentation in addition pix to pix also uses what is known as a patch gan discriminator in a standard discriminator of a gan even if l1 or l2 loss is used as a regularizer the way pix to pix introduced it this ensures a crispness of low frequency components of generated images so you do get crispness in the output of certain large objects in the image if one wanted finer details you need to do better than l1 loss at the image level and the patch gan discriminator introduces l1 loss at a patch level between the generated image and the original expected ground truth or the input so in this case there is an enforcement of a patch level classification of the generated image comparing it to the ground truth and saying whether it's real or fake and this is done for all patches in the generated image and the average is taken to decide whether the generated image is real or fake which is then used in the loss to back propagate and train the generator one could also look at patch gan as a form of texture or style aware generation so that finer details or textures in the image can be generated better using a local patch wise discriminator approach a second domain translation method or image to image translation method is unpaired image to image translation which is an unsupervised approach which is called cycle gan a popular approach again cycle gan is premised on the observation that paired data from different domains can be very difficult to collect it's not very easy for every sketch to obtain its corresponding photo and thus build a data set what may be easier on the other hand is you could get large amounts of unpaired data where you have a set of sketches and a set of photos not necessarily for each sketch do you have a paired photo they could just be loosely different sets in this case it becomes difficult to learn domain conditional distributions the way pix to pix learned to generate these images the challenge here is you could have infinite possible translations for a given source sample because the pairing is not known in the training data given a sketch there could be infinite ways in which you could transform the sketch to a photorealistic image how do you handle this that's where cycle gan comes into the picture it uses two generators gnf which are intended to be inverse functions of each other it uses a concept called cycle consistency 
where the idea is that the output of the target domain output from the target domain should also map back to the source domain and match the input image it uses adversarial training for generators and discriminators to achieve this let's see what cyclic consistency mean the name cycle gan comes from this use cyclic consistency is similar to a concept from machine translation where a phrase translated from english to french should also translate back from french to english and get you back the original sentence in english that would ensure that the translation is complete and the original language sentence can be recovered from the generated french sentence obviously one would want the reverse process to also be true if you start with french go to english then the english sentence should be generated in such a way that you could get back your french sentence by using the english sentence this is this is shown pictorially here so given an image from one of the images from this input domain x you can go to an image from the second domain y in such a way that if you generate back the original domain's image from y you should get back the original image that you started with this is the key idea of cyclic consistency in cycle gans the way this is implemented is given an input image coming from domain 1 g generates the version of the image in domain 2 which is given by g of x and given this input to the function f f of g of x has to generate the image close to x as the final output this now can be given by a loss function f of g of x minus x the l1 norm of this difference must be minimized similarly if you start from the second domain y and generate an image in the first domain which is given by f of y and now apply the transformation g on f of y to get g of f of f of y in this particular case one would want the reconstruction error to once again be minimized as g of f of y minus y the l1 norm should be close to 0 these are the criteria that help cycle gan work even with unpaired images the loss functions are given by adversarial losses let's elaborate on each of them so to go from domain x to domain y the adversarial loss is given by one would want to maximize the discriminator's output on y and the discriminator would want dy of gxyx to go to 0 and the generator would want 1 minus dy gxy gxyx to go to 0 or dy of gxy of x to go to 1 so this would ensure that the image generated from x in the y domain looks like a real y to the discriminator y dy this is the first adversarial loss similarly one could have a reverse adversarial loss for for an image going from given an input an image given an input image from domain y if one generates an image from domain x the second loss here is simply the converse or the complement of the first loss function here the only difference now is the input is an image from domain y and the output is an image from x which is given by generator gxy and generator gyx while these two losses give domain specific losses to go from x to y and y to x we then have the cyclic loss for domain x to y which as we already mentioned is given by gxy of x gives you an output in domain y 
and then considering g y x which is the generator going from y to x of this value in domain y so remember this quantity gives you an element in domain y and then applying the generator that goes from y to x gives you back an element in domain x you would want this final generated output to be close to the x that you started with so this l1 loss tries to minimize that loss between the final reconstruction in the original domain and the ground truth that we started with we also need a similar cyclic loss to go from y to x which is a complement of the loss from x to y these four losses put together help train the cycle gan and with this cycle gan gives impressive results where given an input image it gives an output image from another domain you can see different kinds of images here to make this little bit more tangible and clearer here is an input image and the output image shows the input image in different artist styles such as van gogh monet cezanne and so on you can see here that the styles of the artists remain the same but for the input image which is translated in that artist's style however cycle gan has one problem because for a given source image it's possible that you could have multiple possible translations this leads to what is known as mode collapse where the model may not be able to produce diverse images because cycle gan could just generate one image from which one can retrieve the original image from the source domain and still get a low loss it does not explicitly try to generate different kinds of images in the second domain or the target domain for that matter so the solution to address the mode collapse problem in cycle gans is to embed latent spaces inside the gan framework how do we do that by combining vaes and gans recall that vaes introduce a latent space that is learned through an encoder decoder framework so these methods now that we're going to talk about embed latent spaces inside the gan framework to address this mode collapse problem what we ideally want is what we see below given an input edge image or a sketch one would want several kind of domain translations you may want a pink shoe a black shoe or a beige shoe based on certain changes in a latent variable which is learned through a vae you can see applications of such an approach in say fashion and apparel purchase so on and so forth one of the earliest methods in this direction is known as unit unit stands for unsupervised image to image translation network which was published in neurips of 2017 unit uses a vae gan framework to learn latent spaces and domain translation simultaneously so in addition to the cycle consistency that we saw with cycle gans unit gan introduces cycle consistency even at the latent space level let's see this as loss functions but let's try to understand the entire setup before we go there the unit architecture is based on this illustration here below given two inputs x1 and x2 from the two domains you have corresponding encoders e1 and e2 for each of the domains which give a latent vector in the same space the dimension of the latent vector for both domains is the same given a latent vector from that common space you have 
two generators G1 corresponding to domain 1 and G2 corresponding to domain 2. This gives us four possibilities of generations X1 from 1 to 1 where the input is from domain 1 and the output generated is also from domain 1 x2 2 to 1 where the input is from domain 2 that's why it's x2 but the output is from domain 1 similarly x going from 1 to 2 and x going from 2 to 2 all these images are then passed to a discriminator corresponding to each of these domains to say whether the generation is true or false the loss functions are given by both the VAE loss and the GAN loss since unit is a VAE GAN framework. The VAE loss for domain X1 to X2 is given by a KL divergence between the approximate posterior Q1 of Z1 given X1 with respect to the prior on Z and the log likelihood of generating X1 given Z1 using the generator G1 which needs to be the negative log likelihood needs to be minimized. Similarly, you have the GAN loss which corresponds to X1 coming from PX1 and the discriminator log D1 is maximized by the discriminator and log 1 minus D1 of G1 of Z2 which is a sample drawn from the second domain but the generation is of the first domain. This is now minimized. You would then have the GAN loss, one of the GAN losses to be given by, where X1 is sampled from the first domain, log D1 of X1, which the discriminator attempts to maximize. And then the second term, log 1 minus D1 of G1 of Z2 which is minimized by G1 and maximized by D1. You would have a similar loss for X2 to X1 and X2 to X1 for VAEs and GANs to complete this picture. In addition to these losses, you also have a cyclic loss for X1 to X2 given by a KL divergence between the approximate posterior Q1 of Z1 given X1 and the prior. Similarly, Q2 of Z2 given the X1 that translates from 1 to 2 and along with that the prior and also the negative log likelihood of gener G1 generating X1 given Z2. This would be the cyclic loss from for X1 to X2 and one would again have the X2 to X1 defined similarly. All of these can be carefully understood as extensions of GANs and VAEs, keeping in mind that one needs to ensure generation across domains. An extension of unit GAN is the MUNIT GAN. In MUNIT GAN, the image data, the latent space of the image data is divided into a content space and a domain specific style space. The idea here is that each domain has a certain style. We talked about, with, we talked about this with cycle GANs where you could have an each artist style to be a different domain. The style encoder then tries to transfer the content in a different domain to the style in that particular domain. This is implemented using a within domain autoencoder framework as well as a cross domain framework. Let's see this in some more detail here. So you have X1 and X2 which are images in two different domains. The latent variable is now which would have been Z1 in unit is now divided into two parts S1 and C1. S1 corresponds to the style latents. So you could now imagine a latent vector 
z divided into two parts, not necessarily equal. So the latent vector could be say 100 dimensional, 40 dimensions could correspond to style and 60 dimensions could correspond to content just as an example. So S1 corresponds to the style of the first domain, C1 are a set of latent dimensions corresponding to the content of that particular domain. Similarly, C2 and S2 for the second domain. Otherwise, you could now consider these two as individual variational autoencoders for domain 1 and domain 2. This is the within domain autoencoder framework. Now in the cross domain framework, one gives x1 as input which, which now leads to c1 which is the content latent of x1. Similarly, the content latent of x2 is c2. c2 is now combined with s1 that forms a new latent. The decoder is applied on this new concatenated latent to get an x2 going to 1 uh, which is a translation from the second domain to the first domain. Similarly, the content variable of domain 1 with the style variable of domain 2 gives us x1 to 2 which is a translation from domain 1 to 2. Now to complete the cycle in the latent variable space, one could again take these x's and derive their latent variables through the encoder of a variational autoencoder which would give us s1 hat, c2 hat, c1 hat and s2 hat. Let's keep this structure in mind, this entire illustration in mind now when we look at the loss functions. So you have an image reconstruction loss which is given by g1 of e1c of x1 minus x1 l1 loss. Remember e1c of x1 gets us the content latent of the encoder of x1. Remember this is the content latent, content part of the latent variables of the encoder of the first domain. When the generator of the first domain is applied on that, we get a reconstruction in that same domain which we'd like to be close to x1. This is a simple image reconstruction loss. We also have a latent reconstruction loss where we'd like to ensure that the latents reconstruct themselves too. This is given by E2 of C of G2 of C1 S2 minus C1 L1 loss. Let's try to understand this. Given the content from domain 1 and the style from domain 2, when one applies g2, we get an output. What would that output be? That output would be x going from 1 to 2. Now given this x, when the encoder of the second domain is applied, which is what e2c corresponds to, one would want the content variable to be close to the content of the first domain which is given by this c1 reconstruction loss. One would have a similar reconstruction loss for s2. Let's see that too. Given c1 and s2, once again one gets a construction of x1 to 2 and when the second encoder is applied on this, one expects to retrieve back s2 which which is given by s2 hat if you recall in the earlier diagram. One would want this to be close to the original s2 and this l1 loss tries to capture this latent reconstruction. You would similarly have, you would similarly have terms for the corresponding s1 reconstruction and c2 reconstruction. And a final adversarial loss also tries to ensure that d2 of x2 is maximized by the discriminator d2. Similarly, 1 minus d2 of g2 of c1 of s1 is again maximized by the discriminator and minimized 
by the generator in the second domain. This is the standard GAN loss for the second domain. One would similarly define a GAN loss for the first domain, which is a complement of the same loss function. In case some of this is hard to follow, I would recommend going through these equations carefully. This is an extension of vanilla GAN across two domains and there's no further complexity. With these loss functions, MUNIT GAN shows impressive results of translations from one domain to the other, this time with more diversity and variety by changing the latent values. Given an input image from one domain, in this case cats, if one wants to generate larger jungle cats, you could now, or big cats, you could now get several translations by playing with the latent vector, with the latent style vector of the second domain. And you can see that with different examples here, where for a given input, you get several varieties of outputs in the second domain, which can be obtained by changing the style vector of the second domain. Remember, the latent of the style, the style vector of the latent in the second domain can be interpolated, can be manipulated to change these kinds of outputs in the generation. And as was wanted when we started, this also allows us to vary style and content in a gradual manner across the generations. So you can see an example here that when the content comes from these sketches here and the style comes from these images here, you can see that in each of these cases, the color and style is maintained of the second domain while the content comes from the first domain. You can see this both in the first set of images that go from edges to shoes, as well as the second set of images from big cats to house cats. That concludes this lecture. And to know more, each of the links here provide more details of the paper as well as provide links to the code if you'd like to know more. And this link at the end has a list of all image to image translation work if you'd like to understand them in more detail. Here are references.